This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 1 in the series, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. This lesson is titled, The Letter to the Hebrews and to Us. It's ready for teaching on January 1, 2022. It's authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Now, as a special introduction to this series of lessons, the author, Professor Felix H. Cortez, who is Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University, will read the introduction to this series of lessons. He is married to Alma Gloria Alvarez and has two children, Hadid, a pastor in New Jersey, and Alma, an archaeology major at Andrews University. Thank you, Dr. Felix Cortez. In these last days, the message of Hebrews. It was a church when he first saw her. He was running and around, absorbed in his thoughts, when the sight hit him. The painting was a little less than two meters high and three meters wide. But the girl portrayed in it exerted a strange, captivating force over the young man. Why could he not take his eyes off of her? What was it? After some reflection, he realized that it was her eyes. The painting portrayed only her face, and she was looking at something intently. But what? And why was she so absorbed in it? For a long time afterward, he couldn't get the painting out of his head. Several years later, the painter Arnold Jimenez revealed some of its secrets to the young man. The painting was made to attract viewers to her eyes, but the real secret was in her pupils. If you look closely, you will find out that they reflected what she was looking at. Her eyes were fixed on Jesus on the cross. The portrait of Jesus in the letter to the Hebrews can exert a similar captivating force upon us. Jesus is described, first of all, as a ruler of the universe, enthroned at God's right hand. Innumerable angels celebrate him, worship him, and serve him. He has won the right to rule because he has ensured the destruction of the devil through his own death. Jesus also is the exalted high priest, sinless and perfectly holy. He lives forever to minister in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. He has won the right to do so because he offered himself as a perfect, once-for-all sacrifice, effective for everyone and forever. Jesus also has mediated a new covenant between God and his people that will stand forever. What captivates readers about the portrait of Jesus, however, is not simply what Jesus has done, but who he is. He was born from a woman as we were, and he has been tempted and ridiculed as we have been. Yet, still, he sits at the center of power in the universe. When we gaze at the heavenly scene, with its diverse and fantastic celestial beings, our eyes are attracted to the one in the center of it all, who, amazingly enough, looks like us because he has become one of us. Jesus, our brother, is there in heaven representing us despite the shame of our sin and fallenness. In the person of Jesus, three dimensions of the story of redemption intersect. The first is the local, personal dimension. For readers tired of the reproaches and hardships of Christian life, Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. They need to look to him who also suffered hostility from sinners. The second is a corporate, national dimension. For the people of God who are traveling towards God's promised land, Jesus is the new Joshua. They need to follow his lead. The third is the universal dimension. Jesus is the new Adam, the Son of Man in whom God's purposes for humanity are fulfilled. The portrait of Jesus who captures the breath and length and height and depth of God's love for us is our subject this quarter. And just as the image of Jesus in the eyes of the girl in the painting captured the young man's gaze, may the image of Jesus as portrayed in Hebrews capture not just our gaze, but our love and admiration for, yes, Jesus, our brother in heaven. And now for the start of lesson number one, Sabbath afternoon, December 25. Before we start, let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the 25th of December, where so many people around the world turn their eyes towards the birth of Jesus, and many people are celebrating that today. Lord, we just thank you that Jesus did come and live and die, that each of us could have eternal life, and that he began his life here as a baby, and that he grew up, and that he taught and he shared and he healed and he prophesied and he promised that he would return again. And as we open your word this week, as we begin the first of a series of lessons on the book of Hebrews, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us because Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit, that each of us could understand more about him, more about you, more about the salvation that is talked about here in the book of Hebrews. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Let's read that again, Hebrews 10, 36. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to hear Jesus or one of the apostles preach? We possess written excerpts and summaries of some of their sermons, but these provide only a limited idea of what it was like to hear them. God, however, preserved in the Scriptures at least one complete sermon for us. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. Paul, the author of Hebrews, referred to his own work as a word of exhortation in Hebrews 13.22. This expression was used to identify the sermon both at the synagogue in Acts 13.15 and after reading of the law and the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on and at Christian worship, as in 1 Timothy 4.13, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Thus, it has been argued that Hebrews is the earliest complete Christian sermon that we have. Hebrews was addressed to believers who accepted Jesus, but then experienced difficulties. Some were publicly shamed and persecuted, as we read in Hebrews 10, verses 32 to 34, But recall the former days in which, after you were eliminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Others faced financial problems, as we read in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is our helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Many were tired and had begun to question their faith, as we read in chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Can any of us today relate? The Apostle, in a stirring sermon, however, challenged them, and by extension us, to persevere in faith in Jesus and to fix their eyes upon Jesus now in the heavenly sanctuary. Sunday, December 26, A Glorious Beginning 
In order to understand the sermon and apply its message to ourselves, we need to understand the history of the congregation and their situation when they received the letter from the Apostle. Read Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. What was the experience of the audience of Hebrews when they were first converted? Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. This passage implies that the audience of Hebrews had not heard Jesus himself preach. Instead, they had received the gospel from other evangelists who had announced to them the news of salvation. Paul also says that the evangelists had confirmed the message to them and that God himself had borne witness both with signs and wonders in verse 3. This means that God had provided experiential confirmation of the gospel by signs and other powerful deeds, among them the distribution of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as we also read in verse 3. The New Testament relates that signs such as miraculous healings, exorcisms, and the outpouring of spiritual gifts often accompanied the preaching of the gospel in new places. At the beginning of the Christian church, God poured out his Spirit upon the apostles in Jerusalem so that they were able to announce the gospel in languages previously unknown to them and to perform miracles in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. Philip performed similar wonders in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, Peter in Joppa and Caesarea in Acts 9 and Acts 10, and Paul throughout his ministry in Asia Minor and Europe in chapters 13 to 28. These powerful deeds were experiential evidence that confirmed the message of salvation, the establishment of the kingdom of God, and a salvation from condemnation and freedom from evil powers, as we read in Hebrews 12, verses 25 to 29. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. The Spirit gave early Christian believers the conviction that their sins had been forgiven. Thus, they were not fearful of judgment, and as a result, their prayers were bold and confident, and their religious experience was joyful, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as any one had need. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. 
and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Spirit also delivered those who were enslaved to evil powers, which was compelling evidence of the superiority of the power of God over the forces of evil, and revealed that the kingdom of God had been established in their lives. And so to finish the day, what is the story of your conversion? In what ways have you been confirmed in your faith and belief in Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord? Why is it good at times to remember how God first worked in your life to bring you to Him? Monday, December 27, The Struggle When believers confessed their faith in Christ and joined the church, they set a boundary marker that distinguished them from the rest of society. Unfortunately, this became a source of conflict because it implicitly passed a negative judgment on their community and its values. Read Hebrews 10, verses 32 to 34, and Hebrews 13, verse 3, what was the experience of the audience of Hebrews after their conversion? Hebrews 10, 32 But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. And Hebrews 13, verse 3, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. It's very likely that the readers of Hebrews suffered verbally and physically at the hands of mobs stirred up by opponents, as we read in Acts 16, 19 to 22. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate tore off their clothes, and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And Act 17, beginning at verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and, gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harboured them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So, when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. They also were imprisoned, and it's possible that they were beaten as well, because officials had the power to authorise punishment and incarceration, often without following appropriate judicial norms while they gathered evidence, and we read this in Acts 16, 22 and 23. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods, 
And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Read Hebrews chapter 11, 24 to 26, and 1 Peter 4, verses 14 and 16. How do the experiences of Moses and the readers of 1 Peter help us understand why Christian believers were persecuted? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And 1 Peter 4, 14 to 16. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. To bear the reproach of Christ simply meant to identify oneself with Christ and endure the shame and abuse that this association implied. Public animosity against Christians was the result of their distinctive religious commitments. People can get offended by religious practices that they don't understand or by people whose lifestyle and morals could make others feel guilty or shamed. By the middle of the first century AD, Tacitus considered Christians to be guilty of hatred against mankind. Translating the complete works of Tacitus by Alfred J. Church and William J. Broderick. Whatever the exact reason for that charge, certainly false. Many early Christians, such as the ones that Paul had written this letter to, were suffering for their faith. And so to finish the day... Everyone, whether a Christian or not, suffers. What does it mean, however, to suffer for the sake of Christ? How much suffering that we face is for the sake of Christ, and how much is brought about by our own choices? Tuesday, December 28, Malays. The readers of Hebrews were successful in keeping their faith and commitment to Christ despite rejection and persecution. The conflict, however, took a toll in the long run. They fought a good fight and came out victorious, but also weary. Read Hebrews 2.18, 3.12-13, 4 verse 15, 10 verse 25, 12 verses 3, 12 and 13, and chapter 13 verses 1 to 9 and 13. What were some of the challenges the believers were facing? First of all, Hebrews 2, 18, For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Brethren, beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of of sin. And chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And chapter 12, Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And verses 12 and 13 of chapter 12, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. 
and chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners, as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honourable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them." And verse 13 of chapter 13, Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Hebrews tells us that the readers continued to experience difficulties. Verbal and probably other kinds of attacks against their honour continued, as we've just read in chapter 13, verse 13. Some believers were still in prison, Hebrews 13, verse 3, something that may have drained the church financially and psychologically. They were tired, chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, and could easily lose heart, chapter 12, verse 3. It is usual among persons and communities that, after the thrill of victory passes, psychological and other kinds of defences are relaxed, and people become more vulnerable to the counter-attack of their enemies. The strength that a person or community mobilised to face an impending threat is more difficult to summon a second time. Read 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 4. What happened to Elijah? So, 1 Kings 19, beginning at verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 161 and 162, but a reaction such as frequently follows high faith and glorious success was pressing upon Elijah. He feared that the Reformation begun on Carmel might not be lasting, and depression seized him. He had been exalted to Pisgah's top, now he was in the valley. While under the inspiration of the Almighty, he had stood the severest trial of faith. But in this time of discouragement, with Jezebel's threat sounding in his ears, and Satan still apparently prevailing through the plotting of this wicked woman, he lost his hold on God. He had been exalted above measure, and the reaction was tremendous. Forgetting God, Elijah fled on and on, until he found himself in a dreary, Waste alone. End of quote. And so to finish today, think about those times in which you failed in your Christian life and try to understand the circumstances and factors that contributed to the collapse. What could you have done differently? Wednesday, December 29. Press Together.
What did the Apostle advise the readers to do in view of their situation? What can we learn from Hebrews for our own benefit? Let us analyse how God helped Elijah recover from his discouragement. Read 1 Kings 19, 5-18. What did God do to restore the faith of Elijah, his servant? 1 Kings 19, beginning at verse 5. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Japhet of abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him." The story of God's dealings with Elijah after Carmel is fascinating because it shows the tender care and wisdom with which God ministers to those who are under distress and who struggle to regain faith. God did several things for Elijah. First, he cared for his physical needs. He provided food and let him rest. Then in the cave, he kindly reproved him. What are you doing here, Elijah? in 1 Kings 19, verse 9, and helped him gain a deeper understanding of how he works and fulfills his purposes. God was not in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire, but in a still, small voice. Then God gave Elijah a work to do and reassured him. Read Hebrews 2, 1, chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, chapter 5, verses 11 through to chapter 6, verse 3, and Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. What did Paul suggest that believers should do? First of all, Hebrews 2 and verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And chapter 5 verse 11 through to chapter 6, verse 3. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. 
For, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. And chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in all assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Throughout Hebrews, we can find several instructions that the Apostle gave to readers to help them recover their original strength and faith. One aspect that Paul emphasizes is the care of the physical needs of their fellow believers. He suggests that they should practice hospitality and visit those in prison, which implied providing for their needs. The apostle exhorts the readers to be generous, remembering that God will not abandon them, as we read in Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 6. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honourable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Paul also reproved them and encouraged them. He warned them not to gradually drift away, as we've already read in chapter 2 and verse 1, and not to have an evil heart of unbelief, as we read in chapter 3 and verse 12. And he encouraged them to grow in their understanding of the faith in Hebrews 5 and 6. He also remarked on the importance of consistent attendance at church meetings, as we've just read in Hebrews 10.25. In summary, he not only suggested that they press together, encourage one another, and stir up love and good works, but he also lifted up Jesus and his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary in their behalf, as we read in Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. The 
Thursday, December 30, these last days. Read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 9, verses 26 to 28, chapter 10, verse 25 and 36 to 38, and chapter 12, verses 25 to 28. What point is Paul stressing here, particularly regarding time? Hebrews 1, verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And chapter 9, verses 26 to 28, He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. And Hebrews 10.25, Notwithstanding the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And chapter 10, verses 36 to 38. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And chapter 12, verses 25. To 28. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I shall shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. There is a very important element that the Apostle emphasises that adds urgency to his exhortation. The readers are living in the very last days, as he read in chapter 1, verse 2, and promises are about to be fulfilled, chapter 10, verse 36 onwards. It is interesting, as we will see, that throughout the document, Paul compares his audience with the desert generation that stood right before the border of Canaan, ready to enter into the promised land. He reminds them in chapter 10, verse 37, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. And then he encourages them in 1039. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. This last exhortation reminded the readers and us about the dangers that the people of God have historically experienced right before the fulfilment of the promises of God. The book of Numbers talks about this very thing. The biblical record says that two times, right before entering the Promised Land, Israel suffered important defeats. The first time, recorded in Numbers 13 and 14, tells us that the doubts that several leaders spread throughout the congregation which caused the faith of Israel to fail. As a result, the congregation decided to appoint a new leader and return to Egypt just at the moment they were about to enter Canaan. The second time, the Israelites got entangled with sensuality and false worship in Baal Peor, in Numbers chapter 25 and chapter 24. While Balaam was not able to bring a curse upon the Israelites, Satan used sexual temptations to lead Israel into false worship and sin and to bring God's displeasure upon them. Paul warns the readers of Hebrews against both dangers. First, he exhorts them to hold fast to the confession of their faith and to fix their eyes upon Jesus. And the first text is Hebrews 4.14 4, Seeing then that we have our great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 
and Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Second, he exhorts them against immorality and covetousness in Hebrews 13, 4-6. Marriage is honourable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Finally, he exhorts them to observe and obey their leaders. In chapter 13, verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And verse 17, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And so to finish today, considering our understanding of the state of the dead, and that as soon as we close our eyes in death, the next thing we know is the second coming, why can we say that all people have lived in the last days? Friday, December 31. David A. De Silva explains clearly why the early Christians suffered persecution. Christians adopted a lifestyle that would have been considered antisocial and even subversive, he writes in Perseverance in Gratitude, page 12. He continues, Loyalty to the gods, expressed in pious attendance at sacrifices and the like, was viewed as a symbol for loyalty to the state, authorities, friends and family. Worship of the deities was something of a symbol for one's dedication to the relationship that kept society stable and prosperous. By abstaining from the former, Christians, like the Jews, were regarded with suspicion as potential violators of the laws and as subversive elements within the empire. End of quote. And then Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 164 and 165, For the disheartened there is a sure remedy, faith, prayer, work. Faith and activity will impart assurance and satisfaction that will increase day by day. Are you tempted to give way to feelings of anxious foreboding or utter despondency? In the darkest days, when appearances seem most forbidding, fear not. Have faith in God. He knows your need. He has all power. His infinite love and compassion never weary. Fear not that he will fail of fulfilling his promise. He is eternal truth. Never will he change the covenant he has made with those who love him. And he will bestow upon his faithful servants the measure of efficiency that their need demands. The Apostle Paul has testified, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Second Corinthians 12 9 to 10. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 
One, is it possible to be different because of our Christian commitment and yet not be accused of separation from and disregard for others? If yes, how? Two, the word exhortation in the Bible can refer either to reproof or to encouragement. What care should we take in reproving a person who is discouraged? 3. What similarities do you find between the experience of the readers of Hebrews and that of the Laodicean Church of Revelation 3, 14-22? In what ways is our experience today, 2,000 years later, similar to theirs, and what can we learn from the similarities? Revelation 3, beginning at verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, I counsel of you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Surprise Guardians, and it's by Andrew McChesney. Marriage usually is a joyful time when families celebrate, but Combe and her husband Yong only suffered in their remote village in Laos. Combe, who belongs to the Laven people group, was the daughter of a spiritual medium. She had been groomed from childhood to take her mother's place, but she found the Lord and gave her life to him against her mother's will. Even worse, she married a Christian man from another people group. Everyone seemed to oppose their marriage, even the evil spirits. One day an evil spirit appeared to Crome and laughed at her. Crome quickly knelt down and prayed. Rising, she tried to walk to her Bible to read it. The Bible lay only a few steps away, but her feet felt so heavy that she could hardly move. Her feet seemed to be stuck in the ground. As she struggled to walk, she prayed, God, protect me! God, protect me! Finally, she reached the Bible and opened it. After reading a few passages, she prayed in the name of Jesus, and the evil spirit left. The struggle with evil forces continued for years, but Combe and Young worshipped God faithfully in their home. Their parents, siblings and neighbours expressed open hatred to them. Someone reported them to the authorities on false charges of wrongdoing. When police officers arrived to detain the couple, they were met by mysterious, powerful figures in front of the house. The officers fled in fear. A second attempt to arrest the couple failed when the police officers were frightened away by the sight of two mysterious figures inside the house. Word spread that the couple had special, supernatural guardians, and people began to respect them. Meanwhile, the couple shared their faith with family and neighbours. They helped others at every opportunity, and although desperately poor themselves, assisted those who were even more impoverished. Slowly, people began to come to them for help. 
the sick and demon-possessed sought healing. One by one people accepted God and the couple's home became a house church. Combs' sister resisted the gospel for some time, but one night she saw a bright light shining in Combs' house. The next day she asked her sister how she had light when no one in the village had electricity. Combs did not know what to say. She had been asleep with her husband. The sister accepted Jesus, and there's a lovely photograph of the two of them right here to the left on the page. Today, Combe and Young are shining the light of God among the Laven people of Laos. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open an elementary school in the country. Please pray for the school project, Combe and Young, and the precious people of Laos. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.